The Syrian civil war is one of the bloodiest wars this decade. More than 465,000 people were killed, over a million were injured, north of 12 million were displaced. It started with a few protesters against the Syrian government and President Bashar al-Assad. The death toll has since extended to civilians, children, the sick, vulnerable and normal people of Syria. From offices to outbacks, schools to shopping centres, Syrians have been forced to flee. In fact, it's estimated that almost half of Syria's pre-war population is displaced, a hopeless situation now fracturing throughout the world. And yet, through it all, football has played its part. Ahmed al-Rashid was a typical Syrian. He studied English literature, he lived in a small town near the capital, Aleppo, and he loved football. But then, in a sudden moment, his life was altered forever. Radical Muslim groups led by ISIS began to lay siege to his town. After just two weeks, the resistance faltered. The radical groups captured the young men who were fighting against them, hauled them into the central square of the town, and in front of their wives and children, beheaded them, erecting their heads onto poles throughout the town as a sign of what would happen if you resisted. Now, it was at this point that Ahmed, who was publicly criticizing ISIS actions on social media, realized that he must flee and so he started his journey. 55 days later, he was in the United Kingdom, hoping for a chance at a new life. But that hadn't been the initial plan. Being Kurdish, Ahmed fled to the Iraqi border. After being picked up in a truck by the Iraqi government, he would end up in a refugee camp in Mosul. Initially, he said it was for a few weeks, just while the conflict was passing, then he would return. But nearly seven years later, he's not since seen his home. ISIS then came to Mosul. In one night, the city fell. Thousands were slaughtered. And suddenly, Ahmed was on the run once more. He recognized that he would never be safe in the Middle East. If ISIS were ever to capture him, they would behead him without hesitation. He needed not only to flee Syria, he had to flee the Middle East entirely. And so, with one friend, he headed west. First, he walked to Turkey, slipping through the ISIS grasp once again. Eventually, he made it to Isthmia on the western coast of Turkey, the gateway to Europe for many Syrian refugees, and Ahmed had a plan to get to England. It was at this time that he would begin to dream of his life in England. Football dominated those dreams. He began to fantasize about kicking a ball on English soil, about being in the same country as the great Premier League, about maybe going to see Arsenal, standing at the Emirates Stadium, watching his heroes step out of the tunnel. This was his enduring, undying hope. He twice attempted to get to Athens. He paid smugglers to ship him on a dinghy across the Aegean Sea. The first time, he was caught by the police and returned to Turkey. The second time, they made it. They shipped him to the Greek island of Chios, the dinghy having sunk minutes before reaching the shore and Ahmed swimming the final few meters. From Chios, he was shipped to Athens by the Greek officials and given six months to leave the country or return to Syria. Now, in Athens, Ahmed bought a Bulgarian passport from a smuggler. The smuggler told him to go to the airport with the passport and boarding pass, get on a flight to Marseille, telling him which security officials to hand his documents to and which to avoid entirely, otherwise he would be captured and sent back to Syria, the passport destroyed and his money long gone. In the airport, Ahmed sat nervously, waiting for the plane. A number of immigrants were picked up by the officials while he was waiting, and then someone tapped him on the shoulder. They asked for his passport, questioning where he was flying to and why he was flying there. Ahmed hurriedly invented a story involving a girlfriend and their anniversary. The official returned his passport and said, enjoy your trip before moving on. Ahmed's heart continued to beat. Now, with these documents, he flew to Marseille in the south of France. From there, he travelled by train north, eventually reaching Calais, and it was in Calais that this Emirates dream suddenly became a genuine possibility. He was within touching distance of England. But the most difficult period of his journey was still to come. After spending almost two weeks in the Calais jungle, a mire of crime, abuse, murder, exploitation and unadulterated ferocious poverty, Ahmed did what any desperate person would do. He put his life in the hands of criminals. He stepped into the back of a lorry, not knowing if he would ever see the sun again, and after several attempts, he made it to England. Three days passed. 
He and the others he was with in the lorry sat in a container, similar to that in which 39 dead bodies were discovered in 2019. Suffocating as he was squashed against the other fleeing refugees, eventually someone came to open the doors, and he was in Hull. Ahmed would eventually settle in Middlesbrough. He was granted refugee status after three months, which allowed him to fly his family over from Syria. He later moved to London, and in London, that insatiable undying dream came true. Arsenal, at the Emirates, football, his hope realised. He would meet his heroes, he shook hands with Arsene Wenger, he took photos with Mesut Ozil, Alexis Sanchez, Per Mertesacker and Petr Cech. He watched his Arsenal play at the Emirates Stadium, celebrating a new life. Ahmed survived a horrific journey on which many have died whilst undertaking. He was one of the fortunate ones. And amidst all that heartache and pain, all the death and destruction, all the exploitation and crime, the hope of a future remained.